So let's just quickly go over some really basic steps in getting started with Nature's Notebook. If you've never participated in Nature's Notebook before, this is a great time to fumble around with that at home and read all of the great resources that we have on our website. We have tons and tons of reading material, tons and tons of training material. We have documentation about our protocol and also information about the phenophases that we ask people to capture. So you can spend a lot of time reading through everything we have on the website, but this is just gonna be a really basic overview of how to get started. The first step to doing any kind of Nature's Notebook program, whether or not it's at your house or if it's in a community space when you're allowed to be engaging with other people is to make sure that you have a plan. I tell people that all the time. Um, think about who you want to engage and if you are able to recruit a bunch of people to work on it with you, then I think that is even better because we really want people to be observing for at least a year, two years or more. And the more observational data that we have in any geographic location, the better. Because what we're trying to do at the USA National Phenology Network is create a database that is a ton of information on a specific number of species so that folks who are using that information for research have enough data to be able to tell a story about seasonal changes in plants and animals, as well as long-term changes in phenology related to climate change. So that's why we really recommend that people come up with a plan and a plan that means what you're going to monitor and who you're going to engage when you're doing that. Uh, Nature's Notebook is a little bit more complicated than some other citizen science programs out there like iNaturalist. Although those two things work really well together, iNaturalist is kind of a plug and play because you just can download the app and go outside and take pictures and contribute to citizen science. Whereas Nature's Notebook takes a little bit more thinking to create um, your plan, come up with maybe a science question, think about why you're interested in phenology, who you're going to engage, if you're going to tell them about the data that your group is collecting locally. Giving that stuff a think ahead of time really helps you figure out how to best manage your participants and manage your program later. And now it may just be that you are going to be observing all by yourself. So if that is the case, then um, I think that that's also very nice because you can observe in your backyard, especially now when we're supposed to be keeping our distance from folks. And um, we want to still be able to collect data. Some people are worried that they have sites that are already set up and you know they're not going to be able to be observed because you can't get to a park or you're not allowed to go into a natural area where you had been before. But I think if you are still able to observe in your backyard, then I think you can still contribute observational data on the same species that are being observed in group locations. So thinking about, again, who are the people you're going to engage and how you're going to recruit them and where they're going to observe is really the most basic thing you want to do. The next thing that you should do is take a gander at our how to observe guidelines that we have on the website. So if you go to any page on the Nature's Notebook homepage, and our homepage is naturesnotebook.org, you'll see the menu just like you see right here. The first menu is Observe, and it's got all these choices underneath of it. And the Learn How to Observe menu is going to teach you exactly what you need to do to set up your monitoring location at home. And the other thing that we have on here is why you should be, become an observer, why we're interested in phenology, um, we also have a link to our species list. So you are restricted at this time to species that are existing on our Nature's Notebook list already. You can always make a request for species. So we, we take those once a year and then we add them every spring. But what you see right now are the species that are available for 2020. And we have about 1400 species that you can pick from. So we have species that are generally occurring across the whole United States and all of the different ecosystems. So there should be a few things that you will be able to find and observe. All right, the other thing that we have in our how to observe guidelines is we have a Nature's Notebook Observer Certification course 
that is almost all the way complete, but we do have one module done, which is reflective of that same content that's in the How to Observe handbook. So if you feel like you want to work through that information, that takes you step by step in an engaging way where you also have the ability to answer questions and watch a couple of short videos along the way. And it describes in great detail how you're supposed to set up a site, how you're supposed to select your plant, um, what kinds of things you should be looking for when you're creating your site, and um, how to generally get started with the mobile app and create your account online. So those things all together, the Learn How to Observe page, the How to Observe Handbook, and the How to Observe Guidelines are going to be your first go-to pieces of information that you should start with. And um, they're all in different formats for different learning styles, but again, just a reminder that Nature's Notebook is something that's slightly more complicated than iNaturalist, so you are going to have to read some information and think about how you're going to set up your group and your site before you get started. We also have a how to set up your site video that is linked on our USA NPN YouTube channel, which is the link that you see here on the slide deck. And um, that, again, is another video of how to briefly get your site set up so that you're ready to create observations using Nature's Notebook. We recommend that you download the mobile app first and work on that because we've seen that so many people are using mobile apps now, the increase in number of people that are submitting observational data using the mobile app versus folks that are using it on the computer uh, has really gone up in the last couple of years. So I think um, we've got people of all ages using the mobile app. It used to be kind of a barrier for folks that weren't technologically savvy, but our new app came out last year and it's pretty easy to use. It allows you to create an account right on it. You can also join a group right on it. It's got all the phenophase information on there, as well as the definitions and um, information that helps you identify what um, phenophases you're looking for when you're out in the field. So it's really helpful to have that, and it's really easy to collect data because then you don't have to go back to your computer afterwards and upload everything from a paper data sheet. We also have phenophase photo guides that are in the works, but we don't have phenophase photo guides for all of the species. So if you have a plant or animal that you're observing and you would like to learn how to help us make one of those guides, then um, we can give you a template that you can use to put the pictures on there of each of the different phenophases. And it'll be a nice thing to take out into the field. It's something that a lot of teachers and students will take out with them because it gives them a picture of exactly that thing that they're looking for. Um, because we're located in Tucson and because we have a very small staff and because we have so many species uh, with about eight to ten different things you can possibly observe on them, we don't have a place or a space full of those photos, but we are collecting them as best we can from other people. So we do accept phenophase photos and you can email them to photos at usanpn.org if you feel like contributing to them. We will gladly take a look and use them in our profile. And that is really the number one most requested thing is do you have pictures of all of the phenophases for all of the species? And we don't. Relatedly, we also don't have a way for people to contribute photos right on the app because that, again, is a whole other process. Something like iNaturalist does that a lot better because it's designed to take photos into its database and our database isn't set up that way. So our database is really set up for the observational data and um, not so much the photos, although you can take a photo of the plant that you're observing and upload that there. So if you're working with people and they want to see it kind of a full form photo in the actual geographic location, that's usually helpful for people to identify that. So if you are observing with a group of people, we have the capability to create a group for people to, multiple people to contribute their observations to. The first thing that you'll do when you create an account for Nature's Notebook is you'll create it for yourself. And even if you're planning on engaging a group of people, we still ask that you create an account for yourself that's just going to be used by you. We don't want people to create accounts where they're sharing passwords and emails because aside from that being not good web practice, complicated, especially if the person that set that up leaves and goes somewhere else and then nobody has the login and it just turns into a mess. So our groups are designed so that individuals can connect to any group that is created and contribute observations. 
We have the capability to make people administrators on those groups. So we usually ask there be one or two people so that there, in case one person again goes away, there's somebody that still has information about the group and the plants and you know, somebody's maintaining that on the ground. Um, but that really allows people to aggregate their observations in the database, but you also can use that as a place where people are observing specific plants that you've marked at a location and there's more than one person contributing to them on a regular basis. Now we also are allowing people to create groups that aggregate backyard sites, which means they're not sharing the same physical location. And that may be why some people have come to us over the last couple of weeks to ask about, can we have our class create a Nature's Notebook account, but contribute observations individually in their backyards. So we have several groups across the country that were already using that functionality where they are all, again, using their own logins to create observational data, but they're contributing to a group that is aggregating those observations in one place. So both of those things are now an option. And again, that's why it requires you to think a little bit about who are we inviting to observe? How are we gonna engage them? Are they gonna be collecting observations at the same physical location or do we need to aggregate them in a different way? Just a little bit of thinking about, you know, how are we gonna really set this up to make this most efficient for the people that are participating? And the next step is to invite others to join you, of course. So if you are creating a group, you wanna make sure that the folks that are gonna participate know how to do that. So the screen cap that I have in the middle there is from our mobile app. And you can see if you click on that groups tab when you log into it, it gives you a list of all the groups that you belong to. If you click on the button at the bottom that says join a group, that will populate with a list of all of the possible groups that people can join. So if you had in the previous step created a group for people to affiliate themselves with, then that's how they would find it when they create their account and they use their mobile app and they look for it. The same thing happens on the computer. So if people are creating their login information on the Nature's Notebook website instead of on the mobile app, when they go through those first steps of creating their login and their password, it'll give them a list of all the partner groups that are available and they can find your group and join it pretty easily. That just means that you also need to tell them what you've called the group so that they know what to look for. Um, we try to make sure that people are calling them something. You can see in that list there, um, things that people would recognize or like the name of the nature center or whatever. Um, the, the less obscure that you make your group name, the easier it'll be for people to find it. And again, you, you just need to make sure you let people know what you've called it so they can locate that and affiliate themselves with it. Otherwise, they'll just be creating an account and creating a site in their backyard, which is also totally fine, um, but they won't be having their data kind of swept in with your data under the group if it's not attached to them when they're looking at their observation deck. The other thing that we really like to stress is that for these folks who are what we call local phenology leaders, we really suggest that the person that's the point person for the group or the teacher or whatever whatever the situation is that they have some plan for regularly engaging their participants because we can't create personal relationships our staff of 12 people in tucson cannot create personal relationships with everybody that's observing with a group we really do rely on local phenology leaders to not just set up the account so people can create observations. I mean, that's the first step and it's also very important, but to keep them engaged. So on this slide, I have an example of a newsletter that we send out to our Tucson Phenology Trail observers. We send it out quarterly. Um, and Sarah, who is my colleague that is also on the call, will typically put information in there about a species that has been observed or something that's blooming or flowering right now and show them the data in the visualization tool because that really just takes a couple minutes to do that. Our visualization tool was just revamped and it's pretty amazing. It's pretty easy now to get information out of it. And I'm not gonna go too deep into that today because we do have another video online already that Aaron, my other colleague has gone through and showed folks exactly how to use the visualization tool. If you're engaging people in a group setting, you really want to think about how you're going to regularly communicate with them and how you're going to keep them excited about monitoring the site where you are. And it's a little bit bigger of an ask, 
but um, we find that the groups that do that have a lot more regular data coming in. And even if it's not the same people that are observing all the time, we think that it really helps people stay engaged and it really helps them be interested in, you know, watching the plant or the animals throughout one season or longer. So having that regular communication with somebody local and you being a point person is really critical. Those are the six main steps to the high level, engaging people, creating an account, thinking about what you want to do with Nature's Notebook. We have a lot of information on the website already that how to observe stuff, if you haven't touched any of this yet, is where you want to start. You probably want to read through that handbook and take the observer course because that'll walk you through what do you click on on the website, how do you delineate your site, which, how do you pick your species, it'll walk you through all of that stuff. Um, and we pretty regularly also do webinars where Sarah will just open up Nature's Notebook and click around and show people where everything is. So that's a, another takeaway that I have is that it's something that we really do have to put a little time into thinking about how you're going to observe, especially if you're going to be recruiting other people to participate with you. It's a little less time consuming if you're just thinking about doing it in your backyard because it's really just about you and your site and creating your account and adding your plants and going outside. Um, but both of those things are very valuable to the data that we are seeking to have collected on all the species we've got in our database. We've got tons and tons of resources on the website. We have a botany primer, we have a phenophase primer, we have the how to observe course. And now we just created our local phenology leaders community of practice where there's a forum on that website there. And you can just ask your question on there. And there's about 200 people that are subscribed to that Google group right now. People will see your question and answer it. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have as are any of my colleagues. But again, we really recommend that people reach out through the community forum because those folks have better ideas than the three or five of us that are answering questions from the National Phenology Network. And you may find that somebody out there is doing something exactly like you're doing. So it'll be really easy to just ask, you know, the crowd, crowdsource the information by asking, how did you do this or how did you do that? Finally, here's some information to review if you need help or have a question about getting started. We have a searchable help page with animations on how to do things online. We have support or groups emails available for technical help and help with your group. We are grateful to everyone for setting up long-term monitoring sites and groups using Nature's Notebook. Thanks so much and have a great time observing phenology.